My name is Jose Posadas and I coordinated this event today. It's a movie that I think needed to be made. I'm glad that Lori was able to direct it and produce it. And it tells the history of our community, especially those that had labored in the fields throughout California and other parts across the country. So I'm happy to be a part of this event, the Q&A event with the director, and hoping to share a word about this important person, Maria Moreno. Hello, my name is Fernando Sasueta. I'm the president of La Raza Historical Society of Santa Clara Valley. We're having a question and answer session immediately following the showing of Adios Amor, a story by Maria Moreno, who before Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta ever were on the scene, this woman, who also had 12 children, I say also because Dolores Huerta also had 12 children, she, as a farm worker, organized the farm workers to the point that she was able to be invited to Miami to give a speech in front of this convention of the AFL-CIO at which our President Jack Kennedy spoke, John F. Kennedy. And this was a woman who had two years of education in, in grammar school. She was born in Texas, but she organized the farm workers, and, or tried to, the Agricultural Workers Organizing Committee of the AFL-CIO. Ultimately, that uh, did not go anywhere. Hi, my name is Kimberly Doty, and I just um, preview. I just watched 
Adios Amor, um, wonderful movie. Um, I relate to it, I have a connection to it because my mother, aunt, uncle, grandmother, grandfather lived that. They were migrant farm workers and my grandfather was also a preacher and it just connected me. I got to see what my mom lived through and my grandparents lived through. Es, es bueno que reflejen ahora en este tiempo lo del pasado para que uno esté enterada. Y me gustó la, la, el feel, cómo se ven los árboles. Uh, la señora María Moreno eh, con muchas agallas defendía y es muy importante, me agradó mucho. Yo estoy visitando aquí San José, California y eh, gracias que me invitaron y me gustó mucho la película, me gustó conocer a su familia también, muy lindas. Adiós amor de María Moreno. María Moreno is the key star in this movie. I'm not taking this abuse anymore. And she took action, and that's what she's about, and that's what we have to be about, taking action. It was wonderful. It's fantastic to be able to find out about an uh, unsung heroine who we didn't have an idea about. And just the history, her hard work, we're all standing on their shoulders. My dad was came here as a bracero, and I understand all the challenges that the farm workers have gone through and all the, um, the difficulties that the families go through. So I love the movie and I love meeting the family. We were in line with the family, so it was wonderful for them to share their stories. Nice to be here. Thank you for the invitation, Dr. Martinez. I believe that the students and people in general should really know um, about the history of uh, colored people in the United States and also the struggles that people had to go through in order to support and for all of us to be here where we actually have the privilege of getting an education and we don't have to be serving other people in, uh, in, in different capacities, but where we can actually serve our own community. And also I feel that it's important that we record and we uh, show the history of women and the role that they played in so many uh, in so many passages in history that we unfortunately don't uh, don't get to hear about. We have a chance to meet Maria Moreno's family here after watching the movie. It was amazing. <laughs> Latina woman after today. This movie was amazing and um, I really hope this goes on television or um, and so people can see it and uh, really know the history of what happened to Maria Moreno. Ricardo Esparza, aquí celebrando Adios Amor. Me hizo llorar, me hizo reír. He made so was out the mi historia. Yeah, that was very moving. I, 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 there was, you know, some things I was familiar with, you know, from history, but there are some new things too. Interesting how uh, devoted the research was to come up with this story too. That was impressive. My name is Marcia Jarmel. I'm also a filmmaker, and I think it's just a really moving and powerful story. It's a story we should know about, and uh, I think Lori did an awesome job of, of bringing it home. I 
what a terrific family. Because they always come to the screenings, no matter how far away they're scattered. I congratulate them. I also want to second that. I really congratulate the family. And also, I want to celebrate the research that went into this film. It was just, just to hear how the filmmaker really, 20 years ago, saw these pictures of a woman and it always it always felt like something she had to return to and for the last seven years she's been now looking looking for her. Well, I, I like the uh, initiative she took to find her that, you know she, there were so many marinos around and she she almost gave up uh, but she finally uh, some, she put the word out and something came in the mail. That, that broke it. That was very good. Hello, my name is Frank Reese here from California City TV Show. I saw the movie. Very motivating, very inspiring. I didn't hear about the thing until this movie was made. And I'm glad to be with here some of the family. I'm going to show pictures of this on my TV show too and on Comcast Career TV Channel 15. I am Tito Moreno and I'm the son of Maria Moreno. All that happened today it was all real, it was not fiction. What you saw there was facts, not a story. I am Pablo M. Dominguez and I am one of Maria Moreno's son-in-laws, married to Martha Moreno Dominguez. And it, this film was a long time coming that people could know that. that some people have history that has not been. Yeah, yeah, I got you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank he also owns San Patricio next door and Chancho's next door. I think he's trying to take over the whole block. So good, good for him. I hope he's successful. So I'm really excited and happy to have the director of the film, Adios Amor, the search for Maria Moreno, uh, as well as the family of Maria Moreno. So, if you're a family member, and I'm sure there's many of you in this uh, venue today, raise your hand, because we want to applaud you for being here. And I also want to uh, recognize that uh, this was uh, put on by La Raza Historical Society. We're a, a relatively brand new organization, but uh, this film really touched me as a uh, resident of Santa Clara Valley. I'm sure there's many of you here that have some history, some experience uh, working in the fields. Maybe you yourself did or your family did. Uh, I know that I was uh, young when I was uh, working in a field up uh, by the East Foothills uh, in a uh, prune orchard, excuse me, apricot orchard. So those memories are still fresh in my mind as well. So uh, the board members of La Raza Historical Society, please also raise your hand. I'd like to thank you for supporting this event. Now again, uh, thank you, Lori, for being here. I think I really wanted to do this film for, for three reasons. One is because I just love films, and I really appreciate documentary films in particular. I know they're a, a labor of love, and I know it takes a lot of time to do a uh, documentary. Uh, the second reason uh, I wanted to do this event, again, is because we are La Raza Historical Society, and I do really feel that we need to champion stories like Maria Moreno, and really uh, give people the information of the work that took place in our community, and Latino community, especially for those younger generations that don't have that experience and don't know who some of our heroes were. I'm sure everybody is aware of the political climate right now in our nation, the issues facing our immigrant population, the refugee population, our labor movement. And so I think it's important that we see Maria Moreno as an example for us today and what she did in her time to organize, to get the communities together and really to fight for justice for her community because we need to do that today as well. Mm -hmm. 
So my, my first question uh, for Lori. Um, well, actually, how many people here have seen the film already? <laughs> no, almost all of you. Good, good. Lori, what was what was your inspiration for for doing this documentary? I, I know that you were actually doing another project first when you came across some photos. So, what was your reason? Why did you feel it was important to bring Maria's Moreno story to the public? Hello, everybody. Hello. <laughs> Great to be here. Um, can you hear me? Huh? Closer? Okay. And now I can. Now I now it's working. Well, I'm somebody who's been working on history documentaries for quite a long time. Part of it's because of my love of history, and part of it is because uh, it actually mostly enabled me to be able to support myself and my daughter when I was raising my daughter. Um, nice to be hired for a film that would last two years as opposed to two months. Uh, but anyway, I was actually working on a film by Rick Ana Flores and Rey Tejeres called The Fight in the Fields. And they hired me to go all over the country, do archival research, look for photographs, audio recordings, motion pictures of the United Farm Workers Movement. And I was in an archive, and I guess since you saw the film, you did see this, because that is what happened. Um, I found these pictures of Maria. And in the first place, they were not snapshots. They were just profoundly beautiful photographs. And Maria herself was incredibly beautiful and charismatic, very compelling. And I saw that she was, that she was the center of attention in a very interesting way, circled, sur surrounded by men, and I could see that they were listening to her very intently. I thought, well, that's interesting, at that time, in the late 50s. And then I saw that her children were often at her side, and that was tremendously moving to me, because as women, we are, as working women, we are told that we have to keep our family life out of our work life. And, you know, if you have a sick child at home, it's your problem, or, you know, so the fact that she was doing this in the late 50s was so inspiring to me. And I thought, how can she be doing this? I'm, she has many children. I didn't know how many at the time, um, but she has many children. And how is it that she is not known by anybody? You know, she's not an anonymous, she's not really, she's anonymous, but she's not anonymous. You know, somebody took the trouble to take hundreds of photographs of her. So she, yeah, so that was, that was the enigma of Maria Moreno for me. Thank you. Uh, I actually would like to direct the, the next question to one of her children. And I'll leave it up to you who would like to respond. But uh, what was it like to have the story of your mom up on film and having the entire world really know who she was, what she did, why her work was so important to the community. So I'll leave it up to anybody who would like to uh, answer that. We have a chair here. Okay. <laughs> I say it was amazing to uh, to know that this woman with such a a limited uh, education of barely two years. And to like one of my cousins, uh, she's a college graduate, and she would she told uh, she told us one day she says, "How can your mother be doing that? How can she be doing going to when she first went to uh, Washington D.C.?" She said, "I have all this education, and I wouldn't have the nerve to get up before you know, all these people. How can she do it with such a limited education?" And uh, my response to her was all the time to anybody that would ask. It was, it was, it's not how much education you have, it's not how much you've studied, it's not how much far you've gone, it's the grace that you portray yourself with. That's what makes a person. You can wear the most expensive dress, but if you don't know how to wear it, it's not going to do you any good. That's what my mother was. She, uh, she was an excellent speaker, and uh, to us, I mean, she was, she was great. She was a great, she was more than Jacqueline Kennedy. Uh, she was our mother, and she was up there. And that's a limited education, and so many children. But when, when she went, when she left, she knew that she had, she didn't have any worries because she knew that she had taught us well. She had taught us how to take care of each other, 
and she knew that when she left, she knew that the household would be in order when she came back. So, I mean, to us, it's an honor to have my mother, uh, you know, out and scream. You know, like I tell everybody, hey, you know, it's me. Give me your, uh, I'll give you my autograph, you know, because I'm famous. My mother was famous. You know. And it's, it's, it's a privilege, you know, to have such a woman from, like I say, repeated myself, with such a limited education, a farm worker with so many children, and yet she's known today to the whole world. And I thank God for being who I am because of her. Thank you. Yeah, she definitely is a hero and uh, definitely an inspiration to people that are just learning about her for the first time. Um, I know here in uh, I know here in this room we also have a lot of local heroes, so maybe one day your life will be on film too. So I have no doubt about that because I know what some of you have done in our community. Um, my next question is actually uh, a scene that came towards the end of the film because we saw uh, Maria's uh, life uh, as a union organizer working in the fields, but then you know, we kind of segue into a new chapter where she moved to the desert. And so, can you share kind of what that experience was, finding that information um, and sharing it? Uh... Well, I'm gonna let Libby tell that story, but all I can say is that when I heard that story, uh, I knew that Maria's life and the film kind of turns a corner there, and so I needed to find a filmic expression for that moment, and uh, that's why I worked with my beloved animator friend Robert Connor in Los Angeles to create the sequence of Maria behind the wheel with the, with the, the time lapse of the stars blowing by. Because Libby tells this memory from when she was five, and it was so magical when she told the story. So that's why I represented it that way. But she she can say more about how it really felt. Come on up. <laughs> She's an old hand now. We were coming up in Valle last uh, last week, NBC, and uh, she's getting good at these interviews. <laughs> I don't want to get wrapped up in this cord and then fall. <laughs> but anyway, um, I am just uh, deeply honored, you know, to be the daughter of Maria Moreno. And um, like I said, uh, my roots to me uh, start in the desert where I was raised. I was raised there, but by a powerful woman that taught me how to be brave and how not to be afraid and how to get in touch with the Creator. And uh, my uh, memories of uh, being there was, we were never afraid. I would, don't ever remember being afraid because we knew that mother was always there. And there was just myself, my brother Tito, my sister Eva, Yolanda, and my baby brother Alex that is no longer with us. But he is in heaven rejoicing with her right now. And I know that they're looking down. And to me, it's a pleasure to watch my mother in that big screen and just say, Mother, your mission is not over. It's just beginning. And I am just so privileged and honored to be who I am because of a woman that taught me how to be brave and how to confront life no matter what life threw at me, that I knew that God was always gonna be there. And I knew that I could count on him. And this I learned from my mother in my uh, days living in the wilderness, because it was a wilderness. You know, we, we left, we got up one morning, we fell asleep like I tell in the film, and we woke up in the middle of nowhere. But there was this huge tank of water and those boards didn't look old and terry the way they look now in the film. They were, it was actually a ladder. So whenever we wanted to take a peek from the outside world, we would climb up the ladder and we would look, oh, it's a car coming because I see a little dust. I see it coming. 
And then it would go by, go, oh, nobody came. <laughs> nobody came. But anyway, um, that was, I never, I never, never, I tell my sisters, my older sisters, and I, I feel so honored. My sister Lydia always says, this is your story to tell because you lived it. We didn't live it. My sisters came after us. We were there since the beginning. But God was with us. He was with us and he never left us. How we ate, I don't know. But we ate. I don't remember being cold. I never remember, you know, the sand burning my feet. I didn't wear shoes. My clothes never grew old. But I don't know, it's just Heavenly Father that took care of us. And thank you so very much for just coming out and be a part of this film. And Lori, I just thank her. I tell her that she's our Moses that God sent. And I always say this, you are the Moses and you were chosen to bring my mother's face to light. And I love her dearly. She's my friend, we talk frequently on the phone. And it's because of her and she never quit. No matter what came her way, she never quit. So I just want to thank her uh, for never being a quitter, like my mom. <laughs> well, like I said, I, I, I really enjoy documentary filmmaking. And, and I want to thank you for adding that portion into the film because I think it really adds a, a depth of character to who Maria was and really what gave her strength. It was that spiritual mission, like you said, that was inside her that really drove her for for, for fighting for the rights of uh, farm workers and then to continue doing so afterwards. So thanks for including that. That was really important to be a part of the film. Um, and I hope uh, your sister does not let you climb any more of those uh, water tanks. And, uh, it was nervous watching you do that during the film. Oh, okay, okay. Um, I want to segue a little bit to our other uh, person here on our panel, Albertina, because she is a, uh, the person or one of the people behind uh, uh, Mi Historia. And I left some of these, I think they might have been on your chairs or on the tables. Uh, there might be some still by the check-in uh, table, so please be sure to grab one before you leave. And I would like Albertina to share some information about that because I think that's very important for our discussion and uh, what really is our community. So I'm going to pass over to Albertina, but I just want to say really quickly that Ma, her, her project, mihistoria.net, that was born with the film, they were born together. Because as much as we wanted to bring uh, Maria Moreno's story to light, we also wanted to provide a platform for women to tell their own stories. And uh, yeah, so, <laughs> and Albertina can tell you how she does that through workshops and this online website we have and all that. Thank you very much for the invitation to be here. Um, and it's a beautiful venue that we're in. I love the photographs and the pictures on the wall and uh, I'm curious about the stories that they tell, I'm curious about the stories that you would all tell. Um, many of you that grew up in this area, I grew up a little bit further south from here uh, and uh, Mi Historia is a sister project of uh, Adios Amor, it developed at about the same time as uh, Lori said. We uh, wanted to share the stories of immigrant women and first generation students and and also the stories of farm worker women. We've been working uh, quite, uh, quite, uh, we've been working with Líderes Campesinas, which is a farm worker uh, women's organization to share some of the stories of uh, the women that uh, developed their leadership there. We have uh, conducted workshops in different sites from public libraries to uh, conferences and to organizations that are focused on developing the leadership of women. And so I, uh, along with Lori, together we uh, go and we have a process where we bring women together and um, ask them to share stories from their life. And uh, before I, I forget, uh, 
I'd like to invite all of you to uh, visit our website and to also, if you're inclined, share some of your stories. What Lori uh, also hasn't mentioned is that one of our padrinos is the Story Center in Berkeley, the first people that did work around stories about uh, 25 years ago. Um, they, in conjunction with us, have developed a project called Women in Power, which is a way to gather the stories of women through public libraries and have them sh be shared on a um, larger, you know, larger, um, to, to a larger audience. What uh, Ms. Doria does is advocate for storytelling in, as compassionate action for personal and community transformation. We want you to know that the, the stories that are in your background uh, are the stories that uh, propel us forward and that our youth need to, to know about those stories. I have to um, say that uh, the stories that I, I saw my parents reinvent themselves so many different times. They came from, from Mexico. My father was from Guanajuato, my mother from Jalisco. Uh, they, my father came as a bracero to Chulat. I grew up in the Salinas Valley and then the Monterey Peninsula. Uh, I have the fortune to go to school in the uh, Carmel Unified School District. Something we don't talk about a lot is that uh, in some of the more affluent communities, there are those of us who are doing the work, uh, the service work, that is involved in, in sustaining those communities. And so we are also there. We were a very small group of, uh, <laughs> we were a small family that uh, brought uh, more people down onto the peninsula. So because of the work of my father, my grandfather, and my parents. We have uh, gente in Big Sur, we have gente in Marina, in Seaside, in Monterey, in Carmel itself. Um, and uh, going back, uh, watching my parents take the step away from working in the fields to working on an estate. Uh, my mother was clean houses, and my father was a gardener after he had worked in the fields. So, uh, seeing how res resourceful they were, how they uh, picked themselves up by their grit and, uh, and backbone. And those stories are there. We have to bring them out to the light, and now is our magic moment to do so. Uh, so I uh, encourage you to do that. When I had to reinvent myself after having been in the classroom in Oakland for uh, 20 plus years, it was a story that my father told me that, uh, that he sort of gave me the, I almost said said that look in, in my eye to move forward with working with Lori. Um, Lori gave me my wings, um, but uh, my father gave me the foundation. He was put on a bus to uh, go work in Arizona, and he said, Mika, I did not sign up to go to Arizona. I came to work in the Salinas Valley. This is what I know, and this is where I want to stay. And this is where we're going to make our home. <laughs> Copying the words of Maria Moreno, um, this is where we're going to stay. And uh, indeed, that's where we stay. He got off this bus. He says they were all going off to Arizona. And he says, I got off that bus with just a little cobijita, a little blanket. And I had nothing in my pocket. I started over. And sure enough, because he started over, because he had the agallas to to uh, begin anew, not just then, but so many other times. And his sacrifice uh, enabled us to continue to get an education. He had a, a, first, a, a first grade education. My mother was not allowed to go to school. Those were the times that they grew up in. But they were strong and proud and knew the, the history that they stood on and the history that we all stand on. So um, that's. I guess um, most of what I was my inspiration for being on this project. Thank you. Uh, how, can you help your project? how can you help? Oh, goodness gracious. Uh, a benefactor would be really cool. <laughs> we have about 80 stories that we need to, um, to uh, produce that are in the hopper. That are in the pipeline. Yeah, they're in the pipeline. Um, but funding is tight as it, as it is for lots of arts and humanities organizations. So uh, funding uh, is, is primo. 
also, uh, we are, um, we did get a grant recently to bring the stories of farm worker women to the Bay Area and to the Central Coast. Uh, we're working on that. And I could use a venue. Um, and um, could use a help uh, publicizing that event and bringing folks to hear the stories of um, the women that we're bringing. As you uh, have heard with the Me Too movement, Líderes uh, Campesinas and uh, Alianza Nacional uh, de Campesinas wrote a letter to the uh, Hollywood actresses that uh, broke, for, broke open all the um, sexual harassment uh, in Hollywood and uh, they're, um, they're riding that uh, wave right now and want to talk about that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, those are three immediate ways to, to assist. Do you have a timeline of what you're looking at for the uh, visits? Um, before September, so June. Wow. June, June, July. Yeah, I, it's, uh, we did our first storytelling workshop with Farm Worker Women who were members of Luis Campesinas in 2014, so we've been to the Central Valley and the Central Coast several times and uh, actually did the first storytelling presentation in Oxnard, California, which is where the first uh, the first farm labor strike that's on historical record took place in 1903. Mexican and Japanese farm workers went on strike against the beet growers. People don't know that history, but it's a proud history. One of the things that's exciting for me being that we were invited by La Raza Historical Society is I feel like we're on the same mission, essentially, you know, which is to bring to, bring to light stories that have not been part of the mainstream narrative, and those are the stories that connect to our own lives, you know, and I think that if, if I think that if the historical curriculum in the classroom connects to the community so that kids understand what their connection to George Washington is, or if it's not George Washington, but just so that people can connect the dots to their own lives, they will fall in love with history. It will not be something dry and esoteric and dead for them. It will be living history because it's the history of their own families, of their own community. So I feel like we're, we're on that path together and uh, I look forward to ways in which we can support one another's efforts. And then you stole my question. <laughs> that was actually what I was going to propose. How can we help you to get your word out? And so I know on behalf of the Raza Historic Society, we will do whatever we can to support you, to get the word out, to find venues, whatever it is. Because like you said, we are on the same mission to really preserve the culture, the history of our community. Uh, before you leave today, there were some handouts. Make sure you take one. One is a trifold brochure about La Raza Historical Society and outlining some of our projects. One of them was El Excentrico, and there's some photo displays around the corner. Please be sure to see them before you leave. And then uh, Dr. Ramon also put together a uh, kind of a fact sheet uh, on uh, local Raza women leaders and farm workers. So again, it gives us a lot of information about some of our local heroes as well. And one of our partners is uh, History San Jose. They have an exhibit called in Los Campos del Norte, in the fields of the north. Beautiful photographs of the farm worker life and the farm worker movement. And that's held at History San Jose in San Jose. Good question? Oh, yes. Yes. And, yes. and also the URL of Mi Historia. How do people find Mi Historia? Uh, Google. Oh, no. It's www.mihistoria.net. Uh, and it's on this flyer. M-I-H-I-S-T-O-R-I-A, one word. Yeah. And that definitely also be sure to uh, sign if your you name here. Signed, if you haven't put your email or name or whatever contact here, please do so because we send out regular email blasts, and we'll be we'll be letting people know about the PBS broadcast coming up, um, and any community screenings that we'll be doing. And of course, we would love to bring the film to your community and to your local school. And one of the things that I think is really important that we would be like to do with um, La Raza Historical Society is that CineQuest, for example, doesn't yet have a screening in the schools program. It really needs to have that. And uh, I think it would be good for all of us to let them know how many of our students 
would really benefit from seeing films that reflect their own lives, the lives of their parents, the lives of their communities. So all I could say is that I, I know education and maybe not just traditional classroom education, but education is, is the core of what you, your organization is doing. And we would like to make the film available to further that work. So we're looking forward to that. And I know that the chair, the board chair is here too, right? So maybe you would like to say some words about that. Just so you know, the National Endowment for the Humanities makes grants available for the kinds of projects that you're speaking of. And uh, right now there's something going on in University of Houston. If you contact me later, I can put you in touch with uh, Annette Savala, who's um, coordinating this uh, National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, the Rasa Historical Society is interested in documenting the history of people who settled here. I mean, we're surrounded by our identity. The Gavilan Range, San Jose, San St. Joseph, uh, Santa Clara, the rivers, the cities, the streets. We're a parallel universe with the Anglo community that we live in and they know very little about us. And I think that it would be appropriate for us, and that's why ourselves, our board members that are here, and others that have supported us, will agree with us that we should identify, collect, and digitize that information, those photographs, those oral interviews, those documents that exist. The acceptable project that we started with is around the corner of this room, and there are some uh, images of these magazines that were printed from 1949 to 18, 1982, and we have 700 uh, editions of it. Of that, Bert Garcia Jr. is somewhere. Uh, he's a member of our board. He has these 700 um, issues, and we're going to digitize all of those issues to make them available online for anyone who wants to do research who wants to know what was going on in our community. We print all the social events, all the political events, all the news that took place, the listing of our soldiers that went off to war that came back as heroes, some of them did not come back at all. We want to document all that so that it is available to everyone, not just to us, but to the rest of the community. So Rasa Historical Society exists only year and a half that we've been in business, but we intend to carry on with this. And I hope all of you that are here who support that idea will support us. Uh, of course, there's membership application forms, which are always necessary because you can't do this by yourself, and you can't do it if you don't feel like you're supported by your own community. So uh, thank you uh, for Jose Posadas, by the way, for organizing all this. He's a member of the Senate Club. Have her say a few words about her, uh, her beautiful grandmother. Hello, my name is Lisa. Uh, before, uh, we went, it was my, we went to the desert before this, when we were small, where my grandmother was at, who my Aunt Libby was talking about. My Uncle Paul, my Aunt Shelby, my cousin Maria, and my grandfather, we were small and my sisters. And we got stuck the same way. We did. In a brown car. And we pulled it out the same way. But we stayed with my grandmother, and my grandmother says, it's time to pray. So we prayed. It was nighttime, she goes, remember, see all these lights? Don't be scared, because God is with us. So we prayed, and we had so much fun with my grandmother. My grandma was so amazing. I'd rather have her my brother had her spank me and scold me because that hurt more. And all her, all her teachings comes down from my aunts down to us. And I was, I wanted to bring out my grandmother because she was a remarkable woman of God and of helping people all over the place. Thank you, Lisa. There's one more thing that I should have managed, I should have mentioned, which is that Lisa actually 
did the, put together the paperwork uh, to petition the state legislature of Texas with her uncle Paul. Paul, where are you? Uh, they actually petitioned the state legislature in Texas to have Maria Moreno uh, declared a, a person of historical significance, which they did. So I would say next up is California. I'm try I've been trying. And uh, maybe La Raza Historical Society will be able to help us figure out how to navigate that because that seems like the right next step to do. Um, I'm going to open up uh, questions from the uh, audience in a minute, but I want to ask one last question. It, it, it kind of goes back to uh, one of the reasons why I really wanted to do this uh, event. Um, question for Maury. Uh, so I mentioned earlier about the, uh, the current climate in our country. So how can we be as active and fight as hard as you found out Maria, Maria Morena did in her life? And how do you see the arts, uh, your role as an artist, playing a part in that? Okay, well, uh I'll, I'll just focus on the, you know, the two big things for me. One is the fact that is trying to destroy the National Endowment for the Humanities and National Endowment for the Arts. He wants to get rid of them all together. So I urge you to follow that issue, to go to the National Humanities Alliance uh, website and to see what's happening. Uh, and to make sure that, I mean, the, the, the money that the NEH gives for projects like this is just pennies on the dollar. It's a very, very minuscule portion of the federal budget. So it's not really about saving money. It's about uh, silencing certain voices. So let's support the NEH and the state councils. Uh, they, they were overwhelmingly the funders of this film and films like this. Um, the bigger question really comes down to immigration and immigration reform because the majority of farm workers today cannot say my name is Maria Moreno, I am, I am an American citizen and I am talking for justice. We currently have a system and we have had for years and years a system that uses immigration to create second class citizenship and less than citizenship. It, it's, it's creating a, society, a caste society of people who can claim their civil rights because they're citizens or residents, and people who cannot because they do not have documents. You know, this this needs to stop. We our economy is completely founded on the labor of these people. They need to be respected, and uh, they need to have the same legal rights as we have because, in every other sense, they are part of the United States. They are. They are members of our community. They're contributing to our communities. They are, you know, they're uh, taking care of our children. They're raising our food. I mean, I, I can't even go into it. The list goes on, and you know this better than anybody. Uh, so, we need to understand that with the current climate, I mean, the good thing is that California has decided to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with administration, and I don't think we're going to back down. We don't want our state government to back down. I don't think they're going to back down. So uh, we need to let people know that we stand with immigrants, we stand with the farm workers, and that we appreciate their contributions. They're, they are significant contributions, but they have been made invisible. And they've been criminalized as well. Uh, so. It behooves all of us. Uh, okay, so I'm sorry, I totally blew off the other question you asked. What is the role of art in this? For me, the role of art is to open hearts. It's to open hearts. It's to, when you see the Moreno family on the screen, it's a universal story because we all miss our mothers when our mothers are gone. We all do, and anybody's going to relate to that part of the story wherever they come from. <laughs> And I believe that cinema has the power to open hearts, and I believe it also has the power to open minds. And that's why I want Maria's story. She crossed so many bridges, and you saw that in the, con the Strathmore Conference.
She was elected by Oki, old Okies, old, old guys from Oklahoma in prim suits with, with wearing ties and suits. She was elected by them. She was elected by Filipinos. She was elected by African Americans. She was, you know, she really represented. She could reach across all those sectors. And we need to be able to re reach across those sectors today because our things are terribly polarized now. And how are we going to reach across and make those connections? I'm hoping that Maria Moreno's story will be one of those things that can do that. Um, I think that uh, la cultura cura, that uh, art cures, our, art heals, actually is a, the more proper translation, that uh, we should shine brightly, that we should work in community to change the things that need to be changed and to do the right thing always, uh, even if it's going to criminalize us or cost us, uh, cost us, uh, our positions, our jobs, uh, whatever. It's, uh, you know, it's not like we've had a whole bunch. It's, we, the time is now, you know, the time is now. Uh, one of my best friends uh, who is Laotian and uh, was a refugee and crossed uh, one of the rivers in her country to, to come to the United States, you know, she says, uh, no, Albertina, we never had anything to be with, begin with, you know, let's fight for what we can. And, and just keep on fighting, keep on, keep on luchando, you know, keep on shining brightly. We're a sunstorm that's uh, that's coming and is here already. I mentioned that in this room there are uh, some local heroes, and one that I just want to uh, uh, point out. I hope she's not embarrassed that I do this, but it's uh, Edma Linda Sapiano, who's with the uh, Center of Employment and Training. She's done a lot for our community. Uh, and Melinda, if you don't mind, would you like to come up and say a few words about uh, what you've done and the importance of CET in our community? Sure. <laughs> so, as most of you know, um, I run Center for Employment Training, an organization that has dedicated its mission to um, serve farm workers, and we have uh, trained and uh, educated thousands and thousands of uh, farm workers and other poor people in, in the United States, we're a national program, and um, we, um, I, I could tell you a lot of stories, but I just want to share um, that my um, impression of the movie couldn't have come at a, at a better time. Our community is under siege by and his followers, and we um, need fountains of inspiration to draw from um, so that we can keep the, the fire of the struggle going. And so thank you very much for sharing that. And um, I've been with the program for 50 years, so I'm looking for uh, succession. and. Uh, I've, I've dedicated uh, all of my life to, to service. Um, I am very inspired by what's going on among young people. I think we're seeing a lot of leadership, but we need to see more in our own communities. We, we, we see men coming from Florida. We need to um, really unite and um, fight the insults, the uh, indignation that we're being subjected to by this administration and so um, it's it's I think it's time to say ya basta. Yeah. Um, Jonathan just walked up he wanted to share some important information um, about uh, again the current uh, situation with uh, immigrants um, and just two things you can put on your calendar. Uh, we're talking about uh, important issues today and about our own personal responsibilities as activists. Uh, next week, Wednesday, there's a national student uh, walkout uh, that's being really led by the young uh, youth of our community. Uh, so if you want to participate in that, uh, please do so. 
Uh, at the end of this month is the annual Cesar Chavez March that happens here downtown. So another way that you can participate and have our voices and our presence heard. Um, now we're going to have a few words from our audience member. Thank you for that, Jose. My name is Jonathan Carf. I've taught at San Jose State for 30 years. I'm also one of the statewide officers of the California Faculty Association, the union that represents the 28,000 faculty of the Cal State University System, Twitter campus. So I was raised in a family where we didn't eat table grapes or lettuce because the Bruce Church strike for 20 years. And Jose asked, what can we do? You know, those of us who aren't filmmakers, what can we do to help undocumented folks? All but two counties in California have a rapid response network. And Santa Clara County has had one for about a year and a half. And you could get trained to be a rapid responder. So when I, sh when I show up in the neighborhood, people call this number, it connects them to an immigration attorney, and it, it activates between six and 12 people trained to be rapid responders to go to the scene to have certain tasks. Videotape the ICE officers, videotape their, their interactions with the person they're trying to detain, somebody's taking notes. There have been a couple of incidents where so many responders showed up that ICE left without detaining them. Yay. And so, if you're interested in doing this, Sacred Heart Community Center on First Street in San Jose, for those who live in San Jose, they have trainings to become a rapid responder. And if you're a citizen, that's what we can do to help defend our communities and the folks in our communities who, for no fault of their own, try to create a better life for themselves and their families and lack documentation. So, if anybody's interested, I can, I can go up with them. Thank you so much. Did you learn for the very first time that you didn't know uh, when you were growing up? <laughs> that you didn't have personal knowledge of when you were growing up. I did not have personal knowledge of that lawsuit. <laughs> when Lori showed us that, did, did you people know about this? We looked at it and go, no, where did this come from? That was just like uh, something that I learned that was just like, my sister says, blew me away, you know, because I didn't know that, so yeah. <laughs> All right, any other uh, question, people? Elena? I have a big question left over from today's experience, and that is the, the statement in the movie that said that uh, when you started the research that she just dropped off the face of the earth. Uh, probably the people in the Washington office and the guy in uh, uh, Mr. Green, Al Green, who, by the way, didn't literally disappear. He was just such an ineffective uh, person that everybody left. The Okies were gone. The Mexican Americans were gone. The only people who kind of hung in there with the AWOC were the Filipino farm workers. And they had their own very, very tight units, and they stuck together. And people forget this, but it was the Filipinos who, it was AWOC that started the grape strike. It was not the NFWA. It was not Chavez's union. They voted to join the strike, but the strike was started by the Filipino workers. Um, so that's a really, there's a, actually a wonderful documentary about that called The Delano Minogs, uh, made by Marisa Roy, who um, was a California filmmaker. She lives in New York now, but um, she did, she actually, she actually worked on Adios Amor a little bit in the very beginning. Um, so it's important to remember the Filipinos and what they contributed. And, and also, I should say that uh, Maria and Larry Itliang, who was the leader of the Filipinos, um, they worked together. And uh, the, the daughters all tell me stories about uh, Larry coming to the house to eat, right? Yeah. And that, that documentary is on the internet. You can see it. Oh, is it? Yeah. like this is you get these historians who are your advisors and uh, one of my historians Cindy Hamovic she's kind of the reigning expert on East Coast farm workers and their movements and she said to me I was back in Washington DC with her last month at a conference and she said there's a reason why she says Maria Moreno was exceptional but she also was actually just representative of what so many farm worker women were doing she said there's a reason why women were such strong leaders in the fight for uh, farm worker rights, and that's because they were really the backbone of the family. 
and uh, they were the ones that were fighting for sanitation, uh, for uh, education. They were fighting for all of these things because they were trying to have a better life for their children. Uh, and uh, the earlier or parallel equal uh, migrant farm stream, like the Mercedes, for example, they, they were men traveling alone. And um, there's a, a farm labor force that's not talked about so often, which was the semi-permanent semi based farm workers who were living in communities for extended periods of time, who did try to get their kids an education. And um, when there were labor troubles, what often happened in farm labor historically is when there were labor troubles and there were strikes and the strikes would fail, the men would pack up and leave and go to the next place. Um, but with a family, you, don't, you can't pack up and go to the next place. You kind of have to draw your line in the sand. Um, so that's a very incomplete answer to your question. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.